Hi, I wanted to uh, quickly review some of the material um, from uh, the, the discussion of the um, and Grabio and uh, Brugheri paper, as well as the Suzanne Amari paper, um, both looking at orbital frontal cortex to striatum connections. Um, first of all, remember that the striatum gets connections from all over the cortex, and the orbital frontal cortex also makes connections to a lot of different places. <coughs> um, one useful tool when a lot of different axons are all coming in together from different brain areas, and you want to figure out what is the specific function of one of those sets of inputs is channel rhodopsin. This is like electrical stimulation because you can turn on axons, um, but instead of uh, electrical stimulation which gets any nearby axons, this is going to specifically activate the axons um, of the cells where you put the channel rhodopsin, in this case the orbital cortex. We could record from the receiving cells, but that's actually not what they did. Instead, they're recording behavior and measuring behavior. So, um, Essentially, they're interested in does how does orbital frontal cortex striatum affect symptoms of OCD? Does it make one worse or better, or change them in other ways? Um, so this is there's a lot of different manipulations. First of all, they're focusing primarily on SAPF3 knockout mice. These are the mice that are missing the SAPF3 gene, and therefore have um, uh, uh, and and as we said before, have increased um, OCD-like symptoms. Um, they train these mice to associate water with tone, and then they look when the water is, 90% of the time the water is not there, see if those mice still are sort of, in a sense, obsessively thinking about and compulsively wiping when the tone shows up. Um, and so what they do is they put channel rhodopsin in the orbital frontal cortex and then shine light in the striatum to, um, to see what happens. And the main comparison is what happens in these sap f 3 mutant mice when the light is on versus when the light is off. So they're measuring whether they wipe when the tone shows up during times when the light's on, and then when the light's off, do they wipe when the tone shows up? Possible results? Well, if the um, if the things are getting worse, then this is going to then activating the OFC, we'd observe more wiping because something about the OFC, the striatum, causes obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviors. This is not too out of the uh, uh, blue because we know already. That in a lot of in a lot of situations, the orbital frontal cortex is more active in people with OCD. The other possibility is well, maybe um, uh, activating the synapse makes things better. So what we would observe them is that when we activate the OFC, there will be less wiping because the OFC to them will activity relieves this. Um, this is sort of you know following up on the Chamberlain paper. We saw that those synapses are a little bit weaker, or at least a lot of the synapses in the striatum are a little bit weaker. So maybe turning this on will um, will uh, make up for these weaker synapses by just having more activity. So we did the experiment. The result is when the light's off, they wipe when the tone shows up. When the light's on, they don't wipe for the tone. So that's our second possibility, less wiping when the light's on. When, when, and what that means is less wiping when the orbital frontal cortex inputs are activated. So then our conclusion, orbital frontal cortex striatum activity relieves obsessive thoughts. Um, so uh, we, sort of, we just grabbed this out of our because for our expected result. Um, and so this relieves the obsessive thoughts. Now we're not actually measuring obsessive thoughts. We are measuring wiping behavior. We're sort of guessing that that wiping behavior is a compulsive thing, but that's also compulsive is not really something that we can measure in a mouse either. So what we measure is wiping behavior, and then we're being a little bit uh, in interpretation, then we're saying that this is like a compulsive behavior. All right, the second paper we talked about was the Susanna Mari paper. Um, they started this work before um, and Grabeel's work was published around the same time, and then um, they actually ended up publishing at the same time because they learned about each other's work. Um, here they were interested in, um, again, drawing on the Welch paper, knowing that OFC, or knowing that, knowing that striatum inputs are interesting, and also the Chamberlain paper, OFC is different. They wanted to see, well, what happens if um, we take a normal mouse and we just stimulate the heck out of the orbital frontal cortex to striatal synapses. How is that going to change their OCD-like behavior? One important difference is they're only doing this in wild-type mice. Another thing is that they're repeatedly activating the synapse, and that could cause the synapse to get weaker or stronger. It's a little hard to predict. And also, because there's so many complex ways that OCD acts, 
and that the orbital frontal cortex acts in different situations in OCD patients, we may not have a, um, a really sort of um, confident prediction about whether these synapses are going to get stronger or weaker. So um, either, but, but in terms of our possible sort of theories, possible things that might happen, either activating this might cause OCD-like symptoms or it might not cause OCD-like symptoms. It might make the mice fall asleep, any number of possible things. But those are the two that we kind of focused our attention on. In terms of the manipulation, again, they're starting with just wild-type mice, no mutations. They add channel rhodopsin in the orbital frontal cortex. That's the same as the uh, Graybill paper. And then um, they have two things. Either they have control mice, where they don't stimulate this, or they do stimulate the orbital frontal cortex inputs. In this case, several times a day over a period of five to 10 days. So, and then they're looking at spontaneous grooming when the light's off, either later that day, or the next day, or even a few weeks later. So in terms of our possible results, first of all, if the, if the um, uh, if repeated activation causes the wild-type mice to get OCD-like symptoms, that's our first possible idea, then we're going to see more spontaneous grooming because the orbital frontal cortex striatum synapse causes OCD behavior, something about that synapse is changing. Some invisible change is happening there. Maybe the synapses are getting stronger, maybe the synapses are getting weaker, and then it, they could be changes in receptor number, changes in neurotransmitter release, changes in the number of axons that are there, a lot of different possible changes. If repeated activation doesn't cause OCD-like symptoms, then we'll see the same amount of grooming, and then we'll infer that invisibly not much has changed. A result, when we do the experiment, is we see more grooming, and that lasts for many weeks. And so, our conclusion is the OFC to striatum connection has a very long-lasting change, and that change, again, causes OCD-like behavior, so we just kind of grab this from the because of our possible results, causes OCD-like behavior, um, maybe strengthens the synapse, maybe weakens the synapse, maybe more or less neurotransmitters. A lot of follow-up work has been going on to try and figure out what is going on with this. Um, there are a lot of questions that came up with this and a lot of open questions still going on. Um, there's an active and um, very friendly, actually, debate between Suzanne Amari and Anne Grabiel about how to interpret these results and whether they've really found something contradictory or whether some of the differences between the studies have, uh, are accounting for some of these differences. Um, one of the things that you're required to do is to um, compare these two studies. Um, and on the homework assignment, I asked you to compare the studies and think about how the differences might or might not account for some of the things that they're not. So first of all, there's some similarities. We're looking at OCD behavior. Um, we're stimulating the orbital frontal cortex to striatum synapse with channel rhodopsin. Um, but there are also a number of differences. So in the Angrabial study, they activated this in mice that already had obsessive compulsive disorder or were already mutated to have obsessive compulsive like behaviors. Um, in the Susanna Mari case, they were looking at wild type mice. Um, uh, in, in terms of the measurements, um, in uh, the Angrabial study, they measured a response to trained behavior, this trained learned association. Whereas in the Susanna Mari be, uh, paper, they were measuring spontaneous grooming, just letting the mice alone and seeing how much they groom themselves. Um, in terms of other differences, um, the, in the Engrabial study, they only stimulated it for 10 minutes and only during the behavior that they were interested in. Whereas the Engrabial study, I'm sorry, the Susanna Mars study, they simulated many times over many days and then they measured it an hour later or days or weeks later when the light was off. Um, and then sort of related as well to um, uh, one of these earlier differences, um, the, it's, it's the difference about whether we're talking about what goes on in SAPF3 mice, on versus off, or wild type mice before versus after we um, uh, manipulated the activity over long periods of time. So there are a lot of differences, and one of your homework assignments is to discuss a couple of these differences and um, and uh, explain how some of those differences might have caused this different in difference in result. And so maybe they didn't find some, maybe they aren't contradicting each other so much as just they've got different things that they found in different contexts.